just to present myself, so I'm a research engineer at CEA. Uh, CEA is a French uh, research institute, and I am coordinating the uh, CIRPAS project. So uh, CIRPAS is a, a, a forum for building consensus around the standards-based digital product passport. Um, so we are a consortium of 31 partners with uh, an in initial focus on three sectors, textiles, electronics, and batteries. Uh, we try to, um, to uh, animate a very large stakeholder com community and encourage everyone to describe the, their TPP-related solution on, on our website, surpass.eu. In parallel, we have a large number of partnerships, of course, the European Commission, but a, a very large number of initiatives around the digital product passport. And um, the idea here is that since there are so many people working on this topic, the idea is that we try to align around a similar uh, uh, vision. So. Okay, so uh, we are funded by the European Commission under the Digital Europe Work Program. Um, we have uh, we started in October 2022, and we have an 18 month duration. We are uh, what is called the Coordination and Support Action, the CSA. And as as I said, our mission is to try to build a common understanding on a cross sectoral digital product passport. And we aim to be an objective source of information for the European Commission, but also be an objective source of information for all DPP stakeholders. And how do we do this? Well, by gathering as much information as possible from as many sources as possible, by listening attentively to all, by trying to list the pros and cons of all approaches, and by gathering feedback on our analysis, and generally by trying to put together and help to put together the, the, the DPP puzzle. So, um, so first, just before I start, some thank yous here. Uh, first, to the European Commission officials for answering our infinite list of questions, to Surpass partners for your unwavering dedication, and to the many experts who kindly share their work and their thoughts with us, but also to our, our stakeholder community for answering our surveys, sending in your contributions, your questions, and challenges. So here uh, in May 2023, we have 500, more than 500 registered stakeholders, uh, almost 1,000 newsletter subscribers, 8,000 visitor, website visitors per month. Okay, so this, this, there's a lot of interest with the TPP. And uh, we uh, map our stakeholders according to sector, where the, the size of the organization, so almost half are from SMEs, both small organizations, and 13% uh, um, um, are already, already running DPP-related pilots, so this is very interesting. We use our website to provide as many resources as possible on the DPP, so we have a very extensive FAQ page. Uh, every time we receive a question and we send out the answer, we also publish the, the question and the answer here. Uh, we publish short fact sheets on related regulations because most, most uh, people don't have time to read uh, long uh, regulatory texts, right? And uh, we have also published a benchmark of existing DPP-related initiatives and, and, and an associated annex, and the, which you can download on our website. And the annex is populated with uh, descriptions of DPP related initiatives that were provided by the initiative owners themselves. And so this is a living document and we uh, add initiatives as we receive them. So just a few elements from our benchmark study. So uh, here we used a common analysis methodology to compare our init initiatives with about 80 of them here. And uh, for example, some, some results is, uh, for example, the the product data carrier type, what we observe is a, a variety, as was already mentioned by Michele, which is which is very nice to see. We also see uh, in terms of IT architecture, uh, a, a many uh, initiatives are already using advanced uh, access control mechanisms. And a surprising but very interesting result that we saw was that 75% uh, of the initiatives address at least single item granularity. Very interesting. So uh, just some questions we often receive. Uh, are we the only source of information for the European Commission on the DPP? So unfortunately, we receive this question a lot. Of course not, and thank goodness. 
there is uh, needs so much expertise to to put this puzzle together that uh, surpasses much too small. Um, so, and, and this was mentioned already previously, but I just want to add uh, again, uh, uh, because this is a, a question that comes up a lot. What is the link between traceability schemes and the DPP? And this is a source of confusion for many, many, many uh, stakeholders. And so, uh, which sometimes confuse the DPP with the means to collect data over supply chains. And this is not the, the uh, scope of the DPP. So this was said already by Michele, but I'm just here uh, showing it uh, to visualize what, where, where, where the DPP starts to exist and where the data to populate it comes from. So, so now that we've shared uh, what the DPP is not, so let me share with you the surpass vision for the DPP system. So we really see it as an information system for the circular economy in the same way that the World Wide Web is an information system for the global economy. So uh, our focus is on data level interoperability uh, in order to minimize constraints and facilitate adoption because it's the one with the least amount of constraints. We hope for a maximum reuse of legacy systems and legacy data. And we also believe very strongly that transitioning to a circular economy will require great flexibility. So we need a DPP system with built in flexibility. And we also consider that the DPP will be with us for a very, very long time. So we need to build it with straight state of the art technologies. Luckily, the semantic web stack already comes with most of the necessary and mature tools to link data and metadata. Metadata is data about data, so the semantics. And uh, this for access control, users control, verification, data ingestion, data manipulation, data exploitation, et cetera. Um, unfortunately, the semantic web and linked data concepts are, concepts are not so well known so if I say to you that we propose that the DPP is a knowledge graph, this might not ring a bell with you because maybe you don't know what a knowledge graph is. So I prepared a few slides on to, to present why we say that the DPP is a knowledge graph. And so don't be afraid. This will be a very gentle introduction. Uh, but I, I do need your attention for the next 30 seconds, because in this slide, I present a number of definitions that are very important. Okay, so let's go. So, first of all, a knowledge graph is made of assertions in predicate logic. So, an assertion is uh, something relating subject and an object through a predicate. And the predicate is the relationship between a subject and an object. For example, the sky has color blue. So we can write each assertion in the form of a semantic triple. Here we use turtle a syntax to, to write subject followed by predicate, followed by object, followed by a period. And the period is there to separate each tri semantic triple. We could also draw it in a graph with, a, with, a, with an arrow linking the subject to the object. So a knowledge graph is a directive graph made of semantic triples. So an object can become the subject of another semantic triple. And um, to be, so you see it's a directed graph because of the arrow. So to build this knowledge graph, we need an ontology and we need data. So the ontology, it, it con contains the definitions of the classes of the things that, we, that exist in the data. It defines the relationships uh, with, that connect the different classes and the attributes, which are properties that describe the individual classes. So all of this is the ontology. So, for example, this example comes from Wikipedia. So if, if I want to say Paul Schulster was born in Dresden, okay, you could think that a single semantic triple would be sufficient to describe this. But since we're speaking computer language, we need to be more specific. So here in red, you see the, the subject and objects and predicates. So for example, we have a root node. We're going to describe something, which is a token A, and it is of type person and has a name, which is the string Paul Schulster. And it has this thing has a birthplace, which is of type place, and it has a name Dresden, and it links to this identifier of the wiki data identifier. 
which is a uh, if you go to this address, it looks a lot like a, a web page, but it's actually uh, the the root of a knowledge graph for the data concerning the city of Dresden. So that means that I've linked my uh, the the item my, my token A to a, another knowledge graph. I created a knowledge graph which create connects to another to another knowledge graph. And so. In order to enable this, I have to make all of these definitions. So I, if you go to the to to the to the URIs that I mentioned here, you will find the definitions for these different uh, elements uh, of the ontology that I'm using. You'll notice that almost everything is a URI except for specific strings here. So if I take my the, the graph, which has five, five uh, triples and I write it using turtle syntax, it looks a little bit like this. So you, you find again the subject, predicate, object, syntax, followed by the period. And so here we have a knowledge graph, which we can save in a triple store. And you can see, you can understand right away that you can extend this knowledge graph infinitely and there is no structure. All I have to do is add additional triples. Okay, so what I want to submit to you to, for discussion is that the DPP is a knowledge graph whose root node is the unique product identifier. So here we have a, an example of what uh, a, a toy example of what a DPP knowledge graph would be for a battery. So assuming I can t extract the unique product identifier from the Q uh, QR code and I use the resolvers presented previously to reach the root node of my knowledge graph, well, then I, I reach the place where I can link to all the information that interests me. So this, this product has a manufacturer, uh, which is a company of class organization, and it has a product date, and it has a, a product category, and it has a rated capacity, et cetera, which is of the GPP information class, performance information. It has functional features. It contains a flame retardant electrolyte, which is a DPP information class safety related information, etc. It contains critical raw materials such as lithium, which is a DPP information class material composition information and recycling information. It has a carbon footprint, which is of class sustainability information and it has an event trail. Okay. So using these concepts, I can imagine linking this product with a subcomponent, which might be described using a voluntary DPP, meaning, meaning using reusing exactly the same DPP system infrastructure, but for products or components of products that don't, don't really have to have one by, by law. And so, for example, if I here I'm describing a battery pack, I may link to a voluntary DPP for a battery module, for example, if that is that is useful for the manufacturer. Um, of course, we have to check that this DPP is compliant. So here I may might use the shackle language to verify that all the correct uh, correct links are present. The data is the correct type and the correct values. And so the the these are this is a necessary. Uh, check of information. And while we're at it, we'll also uh, link the uh, access and usage right to the data using the sticky policy concept. And here, the idea is that every piece of data may have different access and usage rights. And here, for example, lithium uh, has free usage rights for recycle recyclers, but it doesn't have access rights for, for other types of, of users, and it requires credentials to, to access. So here, um, a knowledge graph doesn't live live all alone. Actually, uh, the idea here is that we uh, link uh, knowledge graphs together to form a data fabric through the process of data fusion. So here, different knowledge graphs for different batteries by different manufacturers might link to the same URI for for lithium. And what this achieves is that. Uh, market surveillance authorities who would have the same the appropriate usage and access rights could perform queries to the DBP data fabric, for example, using Sparkle. So, for example, they could uh, they could ask uh, they could query uh, the the DPP fabric and list all battery pack models manufactured in Europe between 2028 and 2029 containing lithium, for example, as an example query that that you might want you to be able to run. 
So, of course, this is kind of a kind of vision of, of this DPP fabric, but in actual fact, the data stays where it's generated. So, it stays in the uh, on manufacturing companies. Uh, IT systems, and it's only exposed through what is called an IDSA connector uh, to the to the DPP fabric. And so, what what this IDSA connector does, it uh, it allows uh, to connect the legacy data uh, contained on this legacy I, IT system in the, and exposes the data and the semantics in the correct format. And while we're exposing this data, we simultaneously link the access uh, control and usage control policies to the data. And so there are many different uh, types of connectors. At the bottom here, you can find a link to an IDSA connector report, which is very interesting. It lists a number of open source connectors that, that you can already look at. And um, for example, th these might be uh, instantiated in different IT systems of manufacturers, but also by DPP as a service operators. It, on the other side of the fabric for the use uh, accessing to the, to, to the data, uh, IDSA connectors might be used, for example, to import data in legacy IT systems by, for example, a remanufacturing company, but this might not be necessary for uh, users who don't need uh, complex uh, connector technology to uh, read or write useful data, such as repair companies or consumers, of course. And finally, we have these query tools uh, for statistics and aggregation for market surveillance. Okay, so previously I said the DPP is a knowledge graph, but this is not exactly, if you follow my presentation, this is not exactly correct. Uh, it would be more correct to say that the DPP is a mandatory set of data extracted from an extensible knowledge graph whose root node is a pro unique product identifier. So in our vision, what we see is that short term, what we need is to roll out minimum viable DPPs to comply to regulation. We have to do this very quickly. Uh, so clearly we need standardized DPP ontologies. And we also see that hundreds and thousands of companies are rolling out something that looks a lot like a DPP solution right away. And so they need to be able to connect to the future DPP system. And so what we need are DPP compatible IDSA connectors that can be deployed quickly and massively. In a longer term, we believe that we need DPP system able to change and adapt very quickly. Um, so, uh, we should be able to imagine that the DPP will be enriched progressively, including with non-mandatory data. It's difficult to know in advance what is the really inform the information that is truly useful as recycling and reuse technologies evolve very, very quickly. quickly. So, with linked data, we have flexibility built in because the knowledge graph can grow infinitely and connect to an infinite number of other knowledge graphs. Theoretically, the knowledge graph approach could grow to include information that's mandatory in other regions of the world, but not in Europe. So governments elsewhere could theoretically reuse the European DPP system infrastructure. So you're probably curious and want to explore a knowledge graph. So there's a, you, you may not know, you, you probably know Wikipedia, but you may not have heard about DBpedia, which is the linked data version of Wikipedia. So once you have the slides, you will have the, the instructions that I gave here to explore and play around with the knowledge graph. It's quite fun, actually. And you can, uh, you can run a query and, uh, on DBpedia. So for example, uh, you can ask uh, the, the query tool to select any node in the graph that has lithium as object, or in, inversely, you can say, select any node in the graph that has lithium as subject. So, and you could use, uh, you could filter with specific predicates. Uh, another example of semantic web technologies being used at the European Commission is the, the seller. Uh, it's a semantic uh, repository that was published by the uh, publication office in 2018. Um, so its objective is uh, to facilitate access and searches through European law and publications. And this, uh, the use, and they, they have a query tool uh, that, uh, for example, you can run a query like, what is the European legislation in force concerning the Eurovoc concept, climate change, for example. And so they have very nice documentation, including table three here, 
where which explains the differences between relational and semantic databases very very uh, clear so coming back to Sirpas, um so just to mention some uh, work that is in preparation so we are preparing a number of consultations including one on uh, dpp data gathering efforts uh, identification schemes uh, current standards landscape a common DPP language consultation, uh, DPP use cases, and DPP user stories, similar to what uh, was presented earlier, um, but extended to more use cases. Uh, cost estimation of DPP as a service consultation. We try to link to external resources on the benefits of digitalization for industry. Uh, we are uh, we are. Uh, Working on a study of the potential uh, DLT based services for uh, DPPs. And uh, there is uh, also Fund for ZM is running a study of the environmental impact of the DPP itself as well. As well. So thank you very much for your attention.